Hello, hello, and welcome to Ask Me How I Know. This podcast is dedicated to getting free by telling the truth. I am your host, Ebony Isis Booth, a certified transformation and liberatory life coach. I want to start off by saying that uh, this podcast has been a long time in the making. I am the host, creator, producer, and guest (laughs) of this podcast at present. And a large portion of the reason that it has taken so long to get to this point is because of that feeling that I didn't have everything that I needed to start. Like a producer, a fancy introduction, the right copy, um, advertisers, and all of those things. And you know, y'all, I just got to tell you that I spent about 45 minutes fooling with the media buttons in this recording software to try to decide if I wanted to create a whole show introduction. And the frustration that built in my neurospicy mind as I uh, clicked on different sounds and um, explored the possibilities of what could develop, (laughs) I just got tired and was like, I'm I'm so frustrated that I want to stop and work on something different um, and just walk away. But I am um, exploring the edges of my growth and staying steadfast and committed to the process of sharing what is present with me um, to commit to telling the truth as I know it, um, to spreading the good word that healing is possible magic is real, and love is the answer. And I commit to doing that every week, come hell or high water, without too much regard being paid to how perfect the production is. And honestly, at this point, not even how excellent the production is. So my perfectionist and my excellentist need to go and sit down somewhere because right now what we're looking at is having grace and compassion and gratitude for myself enough to say, uh, done is good. Done is real good. And I'm excited that the episode will be done when I'm finished talking to you tonight. So, um, that is also to say that if you or someone, you know, is in the business of producing podcasts and would like to help a sister out, come on, holla at me, send an email to hello at ebonyisisbooth.com and let me know if you're interested in helping me get this show produced and packaged in a way that is, I guess, more appealing to the podcast uh, landscape, which is, you know, not entirely saturated, but definitely heavily occupied by folks who give fewer dams than the ones that I just explained to you in the first three minutes of opening today's episode. So what are you going to do? Anyway, uh, today um, has been a day. I don't know. How are you feeling? Um, if I give you a really good, real honest body scan and check in, a deep breath today has been a day of some frustration, a little worry, a hint of overwhelmment, um, some fear a lot of questioning, um, and also, you know, acceptance has been a pretty present part of me today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that is, and that'll lead us into today's show where we talk about um, frustrations, fears, and our divine longing or desires, those deep desires, and how those three categories of um, ways of being and understanding ourselves can inform one another, but also how they play out in the professional space and also currently the political sphere. So we're going to talk a little bit about fears, frustrations, and divine longing on today's episode. But first, let me get you a little bit of a setup as to how we got here and why we're talking about this. So 
it all started with a quote, um, or I am starting with a quote from Octavia Butler. Uh, I saw on Instagram or no on threads, which is basically Instagram, the ops are everywhere, but um, I saw someone post in threads that Octavia Butler's parable of the sower is set in 2024. So for all of you who jumped on the Octavia train back in 2020, when we were all locked inside, or for those of you who have been diehard longtime fans, maybe some of you who are not familiar with her work, whoever you, whosoever you may be, um, I want to share this, um, this quick quote that uh, kind of encapsulates some of, or maybe summarizes some of the big feelings and parts that I experienced today that will tie into today's episode. And that is, there is no end to what a living world will demand of you. There is no end to what a living world will demand of you. (sighs) So today in the world, we have Campus protests, pro-Palestine um, protests that are ramping up across the country, the encampment at Columbia and other encampments popping up at universities like Harvard, Brown, um, University of South Carolina, University of New Mexico, um, University of Texas, um, just across the country where student activists are really deeply engaging and doubling down on their First Amendment right, but also calling for not just a ceasefire, but an end to the occupation um, in Palestine, also calling for universities to divest completely um, from funding and supporting uh, direct, you know, organizations in direct support of Israel. And it has been a sight to see in the news media, what has come from that. Um, We have uh, today, Biden signed a $75 billion aid package um, that includes aid support for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, um, $1 billion for Gaza. Um, The also shrouded or or looped in, tacked on to this particular aid package was a TikTok ban um, that is calling for the owners, owning company of TikTok to sell the company within nine months or be banned from downloads and updates in the United States, um, which has set the internet ablaze. And also I think what we're seeing in this is that it's working. Um, the resistance, um, the calls to action, the the movement, the the voice of the people um, are definitely shaking the table to such a degree that you know these systems are in fact um, buckling uh, or capitulating and responding in ways that can feel um, intense. And in in my body in particular, my throat gets real tight and hot and activated this like angry, ragey knot at my throat that wants to yell um, and is remembering the days of my, I guess, undergraduate, early 20s, um, the the voice of protest and dissent um, that was screamed into microphones and into amphitheaters and large crowds and um, not really having access to the same type of movement as an activist or an advocate now and being curious about um, what does it mean to age and grow up in direct, in the field of organizing and direct action. It really makes me curious about what my activism looks like now and how to use my, how to be of service to youth organizers and activists who are putting their bodies on the front line, who are absorbing physical trauma, who are, you know, risking 
consequences, life and limb in many cases, um, being incarcerated and being bailed out, being persecuted. Um, I, I'm curious about ways to be of direct service beyond the work that I've been doing um, in in small community channels and in networks. So that's a thing that I'm thinking about. I'm curious about what you're thinking about, what your activism looks like. Um, you know, are you a social media activist? Um, do you dwell mostly in the stories? Are you posting? Maybe you're one of the people who's observing other people's posts um, to see what they're saying and staying quiet. Maybe you are out at the rallies. Maybe you're writing letters and sending money. Um, maybe you're just having quiet conversations with relatives and looking to, you know, impact the the realities of folks' beliefs and hearts in the process. Um, some of my work has looked like supporting people who are in leadership roles, making decisions around um, their organizations and funders and where money goes. I don't know. It's there's there's a definitely an energy, like a, a an energy in the collective of resistance and um, the folks who are this tension, this resistance to change. Um, the resistance of oppression, um, the the push and pull and the tension between the oppressor and the oppressed, this fight for liberation is tangible, it's palpable. Um, and that brings up a lot of emotion in the body, in my body. Um, it activates parts of me that have been somewhat dormant um, or lulled into comfort um or complacency even also parts that have been um still or at rest following the pandemic um parts of me that spent time during the pandemic when everybody else was resting those parts were very active in the resistance um in the movement for black lives and being on the front line in a way that um felt odd because much of the world seemed so quiet um, around me at the time and internally in community and in um, in space with peers, there was a lot of conflict and tumult um, and beef and volatility. So that's something that has been activated for me in this past several weeks. I mean, it's certainly been top of mind for the past 200 plus days, but this past few weeks is definitely, I'd say since the eclipse has gotten um, turned up a few notches. So that's something that's active in me in this frustration, fear, and divine longing um, that I'm, that I'm feeling, experiencing. Also, news came across my feed today around um, the former Baltimore State's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, um, who is facing a maximum of 30 years, 30, I've seen 30 years reported as well as 40 years reported, um, but 30 plus years, the maximum sentence of federal prison for falsifying a mortgage application. Now, first of all, Okay, well, where do I start? <laughs> I'm not sure. Those of you who, who don't know this, I relocated from New Mexico to Maryland um, a couple years ago, and I'm in the process of looking to purchase my first home in Baltimore. And I have to tell you that the experience has been one of frustration, fear, and divine longing. Um, another example of those three realities or, or ways of being have, um, have been very active for me as well. And finding out about this recent sentencing um, proposal or proposed sentencing, potential sentencing for, um, for Ms. Ms. Mosby is devastating in such that you know, they really don't want us to have shit. 
And when I say they, I like gesture wildly at capitalism, right? Um, The imperialist state, you know, settler colonial state or whatever. And I mean, have shit like fair and accessible equal housing, um, tuition, reproductive rights, um, you know, free school, fresh water, you know, due process. I named it last week. And I mean, I guess we're still talking about it because we still ain't got it. And so we do this until we free us. Okay. Um, But that also got me active and thinking, Um, not so much comparing myself, but looking at the parallels of the extent that the state will go to in order to prevent or impede the liberation um, and agency of those who are deemed less than, not worthy, incapable, not as valuable as um, the dominant culture or the the, the ruling class, right? <sighs> so it's exhausting. The housing crisis is real, no matter how you slice it. Can millennials afford to buy homes? Mm, maybe some of them can. Um, some of us are really out here, you know, crossing T's and dotting I's to make sure that every single application, every duck is lined up all in its row and still facing challenges surrounding, um, you know, property shortages. (laughs) So the housing process, 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 or housing crisis is real. And it is also a process to crack the code. Is it possible? Absolutely. Am I doing it? Yes. But when I tell you that a cold chill ran down my spine, when I saw that they want to give this woman 40 years in federal prison for not, for the mortgage uh, broker who testified that she was not able to, um, to, legally confirm the origin of a $5,000 payment that was made by her husband in the loan application process. And so the original conviction itself was always called the question, but the fact that they have moved forward with the conviction and now are looking at sentencing in this case about $5,000 is wild to me because you know, that's not a, that's not a big number. $5,000 is a very um, reasonable number in my wheelhouse for how much money will be exchanged in the process of purchasing this home. So additionally, there is the, uh, the, the reality of FHA home loans, which were invented in order to make home buying accessible to folks who had been traditionally kept out of the housing market um, by not by only requiring a three and a half percent down payment versus a 20 percent down payment on a conventional home loan, um, which gets you a different type of interest rate. And there's a lot of different rules and regulations about even still where you can qualify, which homes um, are eligible for FHA versus conventional loans. So it's like a lot of rigmarole um, and jargon and and industry language about qualification and worth and value and all of these buzzwords that mean something in a bureaucratic way on paper, but also it is easy to make meaning of these words on the personal and human imprint of one's lived experiences. And that is yet another place where frustration, fear, and divine longing intersect for me currently um, in my life and what is happening in the world. So um, there is a petition um, on color of change for Marilyn Mosby um, to um, to stop the sentencing, to petition the courts to reconsider the ruling. There is a lot of work being done um, on her behalf, but you know, only like 58 people were were charged for this particular crime last year in, on a national level. And the fact that she is being held to a standard that would allow her to be to receive the maximum sentence as a black woman, one with the history of um, uh, in Baltimore as the state's attorney and a previous history as a prosecutor, it is giving um, it's giving 
intentional. It's giving, you know, the fixes in. It's giving racism. It's giving massage noir very much. And, you know, that's the reality of the intersections of certain identity categories. So another thing that I am making space for this week, um, Amanda Seals is has sat down with Shannon Sharp down to the club Shay Shay. Y'all, now here's here's what I want to say about that. Um I want to give Amanda Seals my full and undivided attention for three hours, like I did Cat Williams and like I almost did for Monique. I I think I tapped out of Monique at around like hour two and twelve minutes or something like that. I just I don't know, I fell asleep. But I want to do the same thing for Amanda Seals, but I am finding Shannon Sharp's interviewing style and disposition and the way that he is speaking to this woman to be um, intolerable. Is that the word? Undesirable. I don't want to watch him. I don't, I want to mute him and just listen to her. Like if anything, this interview is, calling me to the place where I feel like I might need to go on ahead and sign up for Amanda Seals Patreon. And I am so glad that she had the opportunity to take up the space to have three hours to talk to Shannon Sharp. I feel like I just need to bite the, you know, uh, yeah, I need to go on ahead and, and strap in, lock in and watch it all. But he is, oof, insufferable. That is the word. My goodness. I cannot. I cannot suffer it to be so to sit, but I'll get there. Maybe this weekend. I need to like go for a walk or like put it on while I do other things. But I also want to watch her because she looks great in the interview. I'm really digging the way that she's styled and how she looks. But something about Shannon Sharp, there's a lot there too. So yeah. So me, me, how are me today? What story do I want to share with you as it relates to frustrations, fears, and divine longing um, that I haven't already shared, right? Um, You know, I'm sitting with all manner of parts that are related to my relationship to commitment. Um, I am waiting for Mercury to station direct before I go out with my realtor to actually pound the pavement and find a home that I would like to put a contract on. And so that makes my butt fall out a little bit um, because it is a commitment (laughs) and it is not guaranteed. There is the opportunity that I, you know, may not have an offer accepted on a home the first time and we'll have to go back to the drawing board and try again. And then once an offer is accepted, the application is processed. There is a lot of things, a lot of stuff that can happen between that day and the closing date when you actually get the keys to the house. And so I am trying to, I'm choosing to accept that I have no control and acknowledge and celebrate that I have done all of the things that I needed to do to prepare myself for this process. And, you know, I got to let go and let God. Um, And I'm, I'm not, there's still a little tightness at the back of my throat about that as I say it. So um, I'm going to continue to play and practice the letting go in hopes that that knot will, will soften. Um, so I'm focusing my attention there to my throat chakra where this, this tightness and this ragey fire and frustration and fear is trapping the d- divine longing of my heart. Um, right up underneath it in a way that I also feel like you ever feel your heartbeat like under your sternum? That is where the divine longing for home and place and safety and rest is for me. So yeah, all of this is true for me while celebrating 200 day 208 days of sobriety 208 days of sobriety and almost seven or six and a half six and three quarters months um as an yao omo shun ori yeo um i am 
still on this journey, y'all. This, so speaking of commitment, a commitment that I made um, as an Iyawo is to betroth, be betrothed to um, my my Orisha, um, my guardian angel, um, Oshun. And that process has been one of um, a test of patience and love and acceptance and grace and sweetness and all of this goodness. And it has also been just like backed, backed right up to almost to the day of October 7th and um, the Israel-Palestine conflict and just the heightened awareness of uh, all of the atrocities in the world. So I'm holding this, um, this newness, this infancy of this new beginning um, and commitment also with the new beginning and commitment of becoming a homeowner in a new city where, you know, I don't really know anybody like that yet. And so it's beginning again, um, starting the podcast, uh, those things, that newness, the unknown is calling me into a practice of patience and presence and playfulness. Um, that is challenging some days. I ain't gonna lie. Um, but I'm doing it. I'm out here. I'm making choices about it. I'm talking about it. I'm speaking my truth about it in hopes that what I share with you about my process as an individual and my experience as a coach and practitioner will unlock or open up a window or door that serves as fresh air to you in your process. Um, Perhaps a reminder that you are not alone, that um, we are a part of a collective oneness and that feeling complex, nuanced, and sometimes conflicting emotions is a part and signal to our humanity and our humanness, and more of the ways that we are the same than we are different. So, you know, in this podcast, I want to support anyone who has a divine longing to feeling seen, heard, valued, and celebrated for their accomplishments, um, for their existence for just being exactly who you are. Um, and that's really my intention. I think if I had a producer, there might be like, you know, a break here or like a commercial or a jingle or something, but, but I don't have one of those. So I will just say um, that if you are interested in working one-on-one with me as a guide and coach, to support you at whatever stage of your transformation journey you are in, whether you are caterpillar, cocoon, goo, and or butterfly all at once, or you can kind of hone in on one step of the process, I would love to see you for a complimentary discovery call to determine whether or not we are a good fit. And my role in that is to bear witness to the miracle that is you Um, to ask you empowering questions, to support you in identifying your needs and aligning them with your values so that you can come into a place of awareness to begin your healing process. Um, Sometimes just being aware is enough. Um, We want to go straight to action. And uh, sometimes awareness is, is the work in and of itself. So, but whatever you may be needing um, or called to explore, I would love to see if we're a good fit to do that work together. And so you can book a complimentary discovery call. Um, I do this for all of my first time coach partners. Um, No strings attached, no commitment or anything. Um, It is a one hour conversation that we get to have where I tell you a little bit about how coaching works. And then I really shut up and listen intently to you and what you're showing up with and ask you empowering questions in a 
a, a coaching session, basically on a topic of your choosing. And at the end of it, we discuss whether or not you would like to continue by engaging in either three or six month coaching container to support you in the um, achievement or the um, the 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 tangible tactile feely squishy part of experiencing your goals um so that's what i do for a living um and it is not just for a living but it's also what i feel as though i'm called Earthside to do in this life. And I feel really grateful that I get to do it with um, Black and Brown women in new and emerging leadership positions um, and also all manner of humans who are, you know, out here focusing on self discovery, radical self care, and full blown love of who you are. So, yeah, that's my commercial. But um, bum. Uh, so frustration, divine longing, also known as desire and fear. What does one have to do with the other? So one of I'll, I'll, those, those three categories or three things can show up in many different ways. The way that I'll talk about them today is, you know, I was thinking about stories and examples of times where I found myself frustrated because I, there was something in the way of a divine longing or a deep desire of mine. And I was afraid or fear was in the way of me achieving or or realizing that longing. And through some discovery work, I was able to get to a place to really unpack desire and separate it from want because want is an indication of lack. Desire is more of a, um, of a forward, a dreaming goal, like a, a, a deep pull, um, that is indicated by needs and values, emotions, and behavior being aligned in such a way that um, gives me a sense of clarity and confirmation that um, indicates a bit of a reward or a proof of purpose um, being fulfilled. That's a lot of words to explain what I mean. And so I hope that is clear to you um, as we talk about this. But I was thinking about like, well, is there a story or an anecdote that I could tell that would make this situation make sense? And as I'm thinking about this now, I feel like all of the situations that I shared at the beginning had something to do. I think that's true for really any challenge that we are facing um, in our journeys in life, just being part of the human experience, right? We will be frustrated. You know, you're going to experience some frustrations when, when things are not quite going the way that we want to, we want them to, or the way that things are going is misaligned from our core values or who we are, um, who we want to be perceived as. And we want that perception to not be in con or that desire or perception to be in conflict with, you know, what we experience. But we don't have any control over that. So we're frustrated again because control is important. So sometimes we cope by performing control or seeking control and prioritizing it in such a way that we can, we think we can trick ourselves out of frustration um, by just controlling. But when you're operating in control, you are often frustrated because you are resistant to the reality that you actually have none. So we be in our own trick bag about that shit. Um, And then there's just 
fear. Ah, <sighs> man. So I was having a hard time deciding on what I could talk about. And I think even now I still am. I didn't really land on anything. I think by and large, if I look at it in a general way, much of my life in the professional space, and you know, professional is really just another term for patriarchy. So no wonder that I didn't feel like I fit in. In many of you who don't know if this is, if you're, well, you're all new here. I just started doing this. Um, I'm new here too, but in much of my professional career right now is the first time that I have been employed with a predominantly black staff. We're an all black staff actually. And all predominantly black with one, um, one woman of color, one Brown woman, um, who is amazing. And I love her dearly. Um, everybody I work with is amazing, but I was always the only black lady at work, no matter, it's just always the only black girl in the room. Um, Many, many times by and large. And if there ever was the other black girl in a professional working environment where I was being compensated and not in like a community organizing volunteer way, I can't recall right now. So the frustration, one of the greatest frustrations for me in my employment space centered around being the only black girl. The Lack of representation in the space led to this inherent, constant lack of understanding where I literally felt the code switching, the pressure to be able to understand and negotiate the dominant cultural way of being in the professional patriarchal realm while also holding being myself and not losing myself and trying to maintain my own authenticity, my own sense of style, my own um, ideas, my own language, the way that I decorate my office, how I, what I eat for lunch, what, you know, any of the things, how I speak in meetings, how, all of the, the cultural gaps that are present um, through race, gender, class, inside professional spaces become sites of frustration and harm uh, for folks who are tokenized, marginalized, or placed in positions where they are the only inside the workspace. That creates a tra a, a, an acute traumatic experience via microaggressions every day that you have to go into that place. Um, I can think for years and years about how I would just be physically sick and loathing going into work. I'm going into the office, logging onto meetings, hyper vigilant about the way that I dressed, how I wore my hair, what I said to try to protect myself or prevent myself from being a, a, a site of ridicule or judgment or a microaggression. Someone trying to reach out and touch my hair. You know the whole know the spiel. We've been talking about it for a long time. And I think though the impact of the work of the excellent work of DEI practitioners um, and activists and uh, folks who have done the work to bring awareness to how anti-Blackness is pervasive and shows up particularly in the workplace, the evidence of the impact of their work is in current legislation that we see where you know, folks are being, are losing their jobs. They're being cited. Books are being banned. Um, you know, DEI is being attacked and cannibalized by, you know, in the inclusion of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, or where accusations of racism um, or wokeness are being levied and applied that also erases the lived experience of folks who have been experiencing harm inside corporate spaces since been, since time, right? So we're experiencing resistance. Our resistance, the axis, you know, the, the, it's swinging back in the opposite direction. Um, and then we have to push back again. So we're in this, 
this tug of war or, you know, back and forth with resisting oppression because oppression is never complete. Um, and also looking for, um, for power to be seated back into the, the community, into the hands of the people who are seeking agency, self-empowerment, growth, um, financial freedom, all of these things that we are worthy of and that we deserve and that we are, you know, that are part of our human rights and our rights as citizens of the United States and so on and so forth. And we're, we're beefing about it. Um, it's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating to have this battle be fought across your body, um, your livelihood, for a percentage, like 70 cents on the dollar of our white male counterparts, um, who may also have, be undereducated by comparison and still paid more than Black women and Indigenous women inside professional spaces. Um, so yeah, it's frustrating. Lack of representation, lack of understanding, lack of demographic representation. Um, there is only one of me in the space and the attitude is you should be grateful that you're here. Um, so as to suggest not to complain, not to speak up and just be glad that we gave you this job and we're paying you this decent salary. Decent. This is a word that is used, I think, and it often makes me think of dignity because, yeah, I have dignity. So I'm always decent. There's no indecency in me. But to suggest that a decent salary, um, it should be accepted when it is inequitable. And that by advocating for fair and equal compensation, you are a radical, you are woke, um, and you are ungrateful for the token of your employment that we have given you. It's frustrating. It's very frustrating. And with that frustration, it can easily turn to anger and rage because the pressure pushes on personal boundaries, challenges, like I said, challenges dignity and respect and self respect. It impedes on the most priceless parts of our lives, our families, our livelihood, our ability to earn a salary, to put a, provide housing and shelter and food in this economy with inflation going through the roof, you know? Now, fear starts to rear its head. Fear of what you can see coming a mile down the road. Racial and gender bias and misogynoir that looks familiar. And we must know this because it is a threat that is ever present, right? It's always with us. Um, we learned or are socialized and conditioned how to um, sidestep, to avoid, to defend, um, to appease, to please in order to keep ourselves safe. But there's also this piece that like, if we do that too well, that we will not be taken seriously, that we are not considered for our skill, for our excellence, but rather measured by our ability to make other people feel comfortable, which is a characteristic of white supremacy culture that suggests that black bodies exist to appeal to the comfort of white bodies. And so the fear factor of that is falling into this trap of some kind of like antebellum, you know, uh, step and fetch it role of or mammoth, the mammification or the falling into these um, uh, dominant, you know, narratives about who we are and who we are allowed to be in the imagination of whiteness how 
we are permitted to exist inside the dominant cultural norms and narratives of of black women in the workspace which is to be of service to white people in power and the thing that scares the shit out of me about that is um by resisting that it could very well cost me my life that's how deep it is it is it makes me remember Sandra Bland um and i i i think the risk of the, the potential cost like the trade off of like dignity and thinking of you know the the history of of lynching and and state terror on black bodies since 1619 and before then i mean but that long that many years and generations of cellular trauma as it relates to violence um state violence enacted on black bodies and labor extracted from black bodies by and large in a way that has gone largely unacknowledged by um by society at large and to know that that is in me it is in all of us it is in the air that we breathe and understanding the risk thinking of marilyn mosby again where it's kind of like this risk of gotcha we going you know like we'll let you have this power as a prosecutor and state's attorney but we're gonna get you back for that freddie gray shit you know what i mean and and again it's that white we of settler colonial imperialism and 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 patriarchy yeah you know massage noir is a thing that goes bump in the night and massage noir is is really this targeted very specific and direct type of violence or threat to black women and femmes by and large where it is a combination of deep-seated beliefs and biased assumptions and racism and sexism that is targeted specifically toward Black women um, based off these dominant cultural narratives about the categories, again, how we are permitted to show up in, white, in, in the psyche and imagination of whiteness, the anti-Blackness for Black women and femmes in particular is massage noir. There's a different kind of tone and texture, a scent, a flavor, a sound. There is an energy of massage noir that is um, is known bone deep for Black women. There's a, a tone of voice, a type of inflection and intonation that indicates a level of massage noir that is so familiar that it sends guards up and makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up so that I can start to think about how to negotiate my way to safety. Am I safe here? Is this person safe? And by and large, the answer is usually no. I don't feel like I'd be wrong about it, but in the event that I am, I wonder how many potential connections and relationships I have missed out on because that deep-seated trauma and hypervigilance to um to prepare myself, to protect myself and guard myself against the violence of massage noir um is intense. And the wild shit is like you know, people don't necessarily believe it. That's the 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 a really scary thing about massage noir is like how I just described how much I know it and how I I can sense it and how I'm never really wrong about it. And even if I am, I still have to trust my intuition because I feel like it was there to keep me safe. I am very clearly articulating my experience of knowing massage noir and still have found myself in positions where I am explaining to someone that I, that that was my experience. And they're looking at me like, no, nah, no, maybe she just really wanted to touch your hair. Maybe he was just, you know, 
maybe he just liked you. He didn't, you know, it, it's, it's some bullshit. And I actually saw some hints of that same experience with the Shannon Sharp, Amanda Seals interview down to the club Shay Shay, because I feel like Shannon Sharp very clearly seemed to me to not have had many occasions to talk to a black woman like Amanda Seal, Amanda Seals with, uh, who was so intellectually, um, astute, well-equipped to articulate herself and advocate for herself and have agency in her statements and in knowing exactly who she is and how she's holding her story. It seemed that oftentimes I sense I could smell the massage noir coming off the questions. I'm going to just say that and I'm going to stop for that. So fear. Another thing that's super scary is the weaponized intersectionality of white feminists. There, I said it. I mean, it's not, it's, it's scary because, well, it's a part of the frustration too. White feminists frustrate me. Um, intersectionality without acknowledgement of anti-Blackness or a Black women or even the Black woman who, Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in and of itself makes my ass itch. I, it annoys me um, and I'm tired of it. So there's a frustration there that can turn to anger. But again, getting too angry and moving into the rage cycle can lead to a place of fear because that can create a certain level of instability for me financially as it relates to my career and choices and who I work with. I work under the assumption that people are just going to, if you rock with me, you rock with me, you get it, you understand. If you are working on your anti-Blackness, um, inherently, if you have accepted the fact of the reality of anti-Blackness and how it functions and are doing your work to hold your line and it be in your lane about how that shows up for you in your life and how you're in relationship with other people in the world, I fucks with you. If you are not doing that work, I'm probably going to offend you. <laughs> and that is also okay. It has taken me a long time to get to that place where I allow myself to speak freely. And even as I say this right now, I feel the knot in my throat kind of loosening a little bit um, or move. There's a shift taking place there because like, I really can't control how you perceive me. I was looking at some uh, evaluations from a, a keynote that I gave a couple of years ago on empowering advocates. Um, and the, one of the remarks, there were like something like 280 responses in this survey from the speech that I gave. And one of them literally by and large, like 89% of them were positive, like five-star reviews, really great feedback. There were a couple of people who were the, the, who stood out. And one of them said that it was an hour filled with hate speech and was offensive to anyone who was even slightly right leaning. And I said, damn, damn, like I hate speech. Shit. I didn't think I had given any hate speech. Um, but just that statement in and of itself, the, 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 embedded racism like that is just like at the root of it that is so very obvious um is kind of like i don't know it's it's a little scary that no matter what i say i can very well be perceived as just being you know whatever a bigoted you know racist slightly right-leaning person might suggest that I am in their imagination. And so it's kind of like, damn, it takes me back to the frustration that I feel about not being understood. And this fear that misunderstanding me or not speaking clearly or not being um, ready or informed or you know, not worshiping the written word, not having a sense of perfectionism about me, not embodying these characteristics of white supremacy culture is somehow going to cost me my career. And such instability will then cost me my livelihood 
and cost me my life. And so that comes back to protests to Marilyn Mosby facing 30 to 40 years in federal prison time, comes back to Amanda Seal being canceled um, for a a conjecture about her likability. All of these things are wrapped up, tied up, bound up in the intersectionality or the the interlocking um, categories and intersections of my identity as a Black woman in the world, a descendant of enslaved Africans. And that shit can be scary. And what do we do with fear? We feel it. And then we face it. Right? I know that these things are not inherently true, but that doesn't prevent them from showing up because all of my parts, all of my conditioning, all of my ancestral DNA down to my bone marrow deep wants to keep me safe. And all of these parts are working differently and using different tactics and strategies to keep me safe. It is a lot of energy to stay safe. And what is safety anyway? My question that I left with, um, my, I left therapy with today was really, what is safety? What does it look like? What is it? And I don't know yet, so I'm not going to even go into that today. I'm still working on it. I'll save that for a journaling project or something and get back to you on what I what I come up with. You have to check me out in the Substack, but because I don't know. I mean, I have some ideas. I feel like I'm safe now, you know, but when I run down the list of all the things that I could, would potentially, could potentially happen to make me unsafe, mm, that is a very long list. And the reality of them, I don't have to, my imagination doesn't have to really stretch too far in order to find ways to be like, well, that would be unsafe. (laughs) That would be dangerous. That could go badly. That could end in a wildly inconvenient way. So. I'm not going to trouble the water with um, making meaning or making story of um, imagining imagining how things could go wrong. But I do really need to acknowledge that fear is um, a very real part of how we cope with these massive changes and the tension of revolution and the nature of resistance. Um, we are afraid because we're human. And it's, you know, that fear is a sign of wisdom and intelligence to let you know, hey, don't go, don't do that. It might cost you this. And you got to do some assessments to really feel like, you know, good about where it lands on your bingo card of, you know, having committed yourself to core values and living as a person of integrity. You got to do that work. And that requires taking a beat for self-reflection to just pause and assess what is it that I'm afraid of, you know? But the biggest point that I want to get to before we get out of here today is, well, what do I want? And beyond want, because want indicates a lack, like I said earlier. It's like a scarcity indicator, right? When we want something, it's usually because we don't have it. I want a million dollars. Do you? Do you want a million dollars or do you just want to look like you got a million dollars? I mean, because you got to get real clear about this, you know, in seasons of manifesting and calling in things and all the girlies want to, you know, angel number you to death and all that other good stuff. And listen, I get it. I believe in manifestation. I have, I, but I also, more importantly, I expect miracles. Um, there there's the the miracle is is powerful and manifestation has you know less to do with that but again that's a, maybe a podcast for another day we'll talk about that magic miracles and manifestation um i'm going to write that down but right now i'm talking about divine longing um what do i want what do i really want I'm like, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not about what I want. What do I desire? What do I long for? Where do I, where does my heart pull? Where's my heart pulling me? If I sit in my body and unclench my butt cheeks and just let myself rest and be 
a breathing, beating, pulsing life form existing, an organic situation of flesh and blood and bone and stardust, right? If I allow myself to just be there, where is my heart? Where is my soul pulling me toward? What do I desire? A deeper spiritual connection. I desire love, to embody love, to to feel grace, to breathe freely, to just exist without toil and torment and labor and trauma. Like, you know, freedom. Freedom. I want to. I want to be free. I want freedom and agency. I desire um, that in a way that will pull me, bring me closer to the divine, bring me closer to my humanity, bring me closer to my my um, the earth, and and let me exist as an organic part presence principle on this planet to create art, to make love, to laugh, to have joy, to pleasure, to just literally experience ecstasy. That's a divine longing that I have. I feel that down deep in my bones. And I need that to be accessible to me at all times. I want to be able to, I need I need it. I need to get there. And how can I get, how, how can I understand what I need and give myself permission to have needs and to articulate them and to be um, in tune with my emotions and the information or the data that they are sending to me to let me know what this body needs moment to moment. How do I go about meeting those needs? And is that process in alignment with my core values? Am I malicious and nefarious in the, in the way that I meet my needs? Am I manipulative in order to get things without having to say that I need them? Am I operating out of ego and expectation that somebody it's somebody else's responsibility to do the thing for me? And then when that expectation is not met because I don't have an agreement, have not made an agreement with that person, and I'm manipulating them and ex- ex- uh um, extracting their energy and resources in the name of filling my own cup without any kind of interdependence or exchange or reciprocity. When I'm doing that, am I in alignment with who I say, what I say is really important to me, what I value, right? How am I behaving? So in order to get to a place of divine longing and desires fulfilled there's a journey of needs values emotions and behaviors that all kind of have to line up just so and alignment i don't mean like a straight line i mean like a balance right some of sometimes those things might cantilever off one another but to get to a place of such balance with my needs values emotional intelligence and behaviors that i am living into and creating a portal for me to access the experience in my body of divine the thing that i desire most peace self love security, community, laughter, pleasure, right? But we have to be able to name the thing. We have to be able to say it, you know? To say, I need understanding. I need validation. For such a long time, I was so hard on myself about needing external validation. Like it was, how dare you? (laughs) How dare you? 
need to be validated by someone else, some other entity. That is so, you don't need nobody for nothing. You validate yourself. Well, that's silly. It's okay for me to want someone to see and celebrate. I worked really hard on this thing. I created something that I think is beautiful and I want you to come look at it so that you can experience this beauty. You didn't think it was beautiful? Oh, damn. Well, what did you think? That's great. Now we're having a conversation about this thing that exists in the world now. Let's have a meal and sit around it and look at it or talk about it or I don't know, create something together in community around this mutual experience that we get to share. The validation is witnessing the experience of this art, of this project, this creation. Hell, maybe even this email. You know what I mean? Like, think about how bent out of shape you get. You don't get an email response to an email you really wanted people to respond to because you put a lot of effort into sending the response or sending the email, right? I don't need validation. I got to give people grace. Listen, it is fine to be bummed out that nobody responded. It's okay. It's human. It's fine. You are not, there's nothing wrong with you. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with me. We're just out here existing and hoping that other people care as much as we do about things and wanting to find people who care too. That's all right. I don't know what has happened that that makes, I mean, it, maybe there are just some people who don't agree with that and that's fine too. Shout out to you. If you're like, validation is a lie. I don't need it. Neither do you. I won't give it. More power to you. I, me, myself personally, am not that person. I enjoy validation. I really love to use my voice and my language to articulate the interiority of my being and to express emotions and to process information aloud in community, in conversation with other people. I really enjoy that. I am also an introvert and spend several hours of the day in utter silence, and I love it. However, I have a divine longing for connection. I need connection. I need to, I need understanding and compassion. I need validation. I need safe and inclusive spaces where I can be nourished and nurtured so that I can grow because I'm still changing. I'm still growing. I don't know who I'm going to be a year from now, two years from now. I'm excited to meet her 20 years from now, God willing. Like I, I am excited to meet that version of myself and I will never not need community and relationship it's you don't grow you don't mature out of needing humans it's not how this works so trying to trick ourselves into or out of or hustle ourselves out of connection and love and grace and compassion it feels like an exhaustion of energy that may be um needed elsewhere Maybe our creative resources could benefit from some of that energy and attention, perhaps. So yeah, divine longing that what you desire desires you right on back and is just waiting to deliver, you know? I think I believe deeply in the value of unique experiences. Our desire to replicate experiences or duplicate everything um, and feeds this comparison monster monster that diminishes our self-confidence. So, you know, social media for me, is one of those places where that can happen, where it's kind of like, man, if I sit here and compare myself to everybody else all the time, my house is never going to be big enough. My car is not nice enough. Like the, the weave 
the lace is not HD enough. <laughs> it's not melted enough. The edges are not plucked thin enough. Like you just never be satisfied if you're constantly operating from the space of comparison. So I have this divine longing and this deep desire to have unique experiences that are valued that are valued by the people who participate in them, that we get to revel in our humanness and oneness together. And that when I have an experience that is unique to me or a perspective that is unique to me that I would like to share, that I can make a contribution into a space such as the podcast world and know that it's valued because I hear feedback. Um, I get juicy voice notes from the homies who are like, the one homie was like, I hate podcasts, but I listened to yours and I really liked it. And I shared it with someone who also loved it. And then she sent me feedback of what that person said. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay to have desires. It's okay. It's beyond okay. It's it's natural. It's human. It's evidence of your existence and your innate being to have a deep longing inside your soul for something more different, deeper, more expansive, um, I don't know, juicy, salacious, whatever, whatever it is, it's okay. You're out here being a human, spinning around on this rock in an ever-expanding universe that is like on all kinds of wild spirals. You're doing great, sweetie. (laughs) We're doing all right, you know? So yeah, everybody wants to be heard, seen, loved, and valued. And the value really goes beyond monetary. Like, it's not, it's not just, it's not just the money, beloved. It's not just the money. I want to share this um, prayer before we get ready to close. I don't know. This episode feels like it kind of took a couple of turns. Thank you for rocking with me. But I want to close this week's episode um, or just this talk with gratitude. First of all, to you for listening. Thank you for tuning in to episode two of Ask Me How I Know. Um, I am still figuring this thing out. And so thank you for being present to the experiment and um, also a participant in the unique experience that satisfies my divine longing for connection, um, understanding, and validation you know, cause I'm human. <laughs> um, but also listening to me unpack and explore some of the ways that frustration and fear can be louder than the divine longing and desire and can get in the way of my ability to access what it's all about at the end of the day. And I hope you notice that when we get to the desire and divine longing portion of the discussion, things like race and class and gender and um, the societal, the social constructs that limit and stratify us, um, that are used to justify dehumanization of Black and brown people and indigenous people in this world, the people of the global majority who are um, oppressed under the heel of settler colonialism and imperialist rule. Um, in late stage capitalism, we are worthy just by proxy of our humanness. Our existence is the resistance. Our breath is the revolution. Our joy is radical and effective in this resistance and in this movement for liberation. And healing is possible. Magic is real. Love is the answer. That is all I'm going to say about that. So keep living. 
And I'm going to close with a, a, a prayer or a blessing that was gifted to me by um, uh, one of the alumni, um, phenomenal um, therapist and liberatory coach, Shonda Sug, who um, shared this with me at a time where I was, you know, going through some changes. <laughs> and it goes like this. Creativity and friendship be equal to the grandeur and the call of your soul. May the one you long for long for you. May your dreams gradually reveal the destinations of your soul's desire. May a secret providence guide your thoughts and nurture your feelings. May your mind inhabit your life with the sureness with which your body inhabits the world. May your heart never be haunted by ghost structures of old damage. May you come to accept your longing as divine urgency. May you know the urgency with which God longs for you. Ashe. Amen. Ao. Yeah. May all of these blessings be upon you. Uh, yeah. So thank you for sitting with me for this week's episode of Ask Me How I Know. I look forward to getting back together with you next week. Um, in the meantime, be light, shine.